Another trend that we see in the Roberts Court is the refusal to accept social science data as a factor in establishing the existence of racial inequalities. In the parents' case, the court rejected social science data demonstrating the benefits of education in racially integrated classrooms. In the voting rights case in Bartlett, it rejected social science data that demonstrated the existence of white racial block voting in favor of a workable standard and a clear line. It said that any approach uh, that might involve the consideration of this data would place the courts in the untenable position of predicting many political variables and typing of them to uh, reach race-based assumptions. So he rejected that data in two cases. However, there are other examples in which the court considers anecdotal and speculative social science justifications as a basis for its decision. An important one is in the context of Gonzalez versus Carhartt, the partial birth abortion decision in which the court upholds a law, upholds a law that limits a particular procedure for abortion. And the uh, Justice Roberts joins an opinion that without any citation to evidence, uh, or to a decision concludes that women are likely to regret their decision to have an abortion. So whereas reams of social science data were introduced in the voting rights case, reams of social science data introduced in the school desegregation case regarding effective education in the Gonzalez versus Cartwright case, a Carhartt case without the citation of information reaches a conclusion about how women feel after an abortion. And another example, many of you are familiar with the court's decision in Citizen United. The question there was whether corporations are persons with First Amendment rights that enable corporations to make unlimited monetary political contributions. And so the question was, is a corporation a person? In this decision, the court utilizes social science data to determine that corporations are citizens with First Amendment rights. In particular, they cite statistics showing that the sheer number of businesses in the United States is a basis for deeming them individual citizens. So the court looks at lots of data and concludes from that data that it would deny an important voice in the political process if it did not declare that corporations are people too. So the court is a little selective. Uh, we just heard oral argument in a case involving social science, the Walmart stores versus Duke's case, which ask the question whether social science data should go beyond describing general research about workplace stereotypes to draw specific conclusions about flaws in Walmart's um, personnel policies. Um, uh, and from the bench, there were numerous questions from the justices, from some of the justices, suggesting that social science data that might prove a culture of gender discrimination, and by extension, we might say racial discrimination, may be irrelevant in uh, the view of the court to demonstrating the existence of a pattern and practice of discrimination. And so the outcome of this case will determine whether and to what extent social science may be used in discrimination cases. Um, uh, Justice Scalia had a number of points. He couldn't quite see the idea of a culture of bias. Uh, he couldn't see that individual decisions might take place in a larger social and cultural context. Um, and in the three decisions, the parents' decision, the Ricci decision, and the Bartlett decision, we see the possibility that the court will find that this research is too inconclusive and too speculative to constitute valid determinants of gender discrimination uh, and might continue the trend to reject the data in the context of racial discrimination as well. So we'll stay tuned for that decision. Another consequence of the decision so far by the Roberts courts is 
a hostility to the states as laboratories of racial integration and democratization. In <coughs> consequence of the parents' case is a weakening of state and school, local school boards' ability to diversify and integrate their schools as they think will be best for the quality of education children receive there. In the context of voting, the court strikes down a state redistricting plan that is attempting to preserve minority voting power. In many instances, states have been laboratories for democratization and integration. We have some examples here. Massachusetts initiated minimum wage laws. Wyoming, a pioneer in women's suffrage. Wisconsin pioneered unemployment insurance. Um, and there are many benefits here. Um, the states can find the best solutions to their own problems, uh, and other states may benefit from that experimentation, and that states are often the primary drivers behind many new social, economic, and political ideas. So future implications of these decisions that existing racial disparities will be exacerbated or either remedy, depending on how the Roberts Court decides future cases. It is too early to tell yet. We only have four cases. However, we do have a presidential uh, uh, election season, which has already begun. There have already been uh, forums in uh, Iowa. Uh, the various candidates are raising money. We can see some of the possible candidates uh, for that election. And so the Roberts legacy largely will depend on how the court is reshaped via judicial appointments of the next two presidents of the United States. So given the, um, also I should say, the political makeup of the United States Senate will also be determinative of the Roberts legacy. The president nominates justices to the court and the Senate confirms. And depending on the makeup of the Senate, the president's nominees will survive or not. So we have a number of Senate races in 2012. Um, here are just some uh, that may be contentious. I don't know, maybe I think maybe uh, Senator Hatch may have decided not to run again, but there's some important races divided among Republicans and Democrats. The Senate. Uh, is currently closely divided with 51 Democrats, two independents who vote with the Democratic caucus, who caucus with the Democrats, and 47 Republicans. We have 33 seats up, 16 Democrats seeking re-election, four, four retiring, seven Republicans seeking re-election, three retiring, and one independent seeking re-election, uh, Lieberman uh, from Connecticut. So there's a lot at stake in the Senate races and also a lot at stake in the, uh, a lot at stake uh, in the Senate races and a, and a great deal at stake uh, in the next uh, presidential race. Next two. So right now, uh, the justices um, who are older and most likely to retire are Ginsburg and Breyer. Of course, Souter did step down, and also Stevens stepped down, and they're now replaced by uh, Justices Kagan and Sotomayor, so we have yet to see a um, uh, little bit of uh, uh, information about their influence. But as these other justices age, for example, Justice Kennedy, uh, Justice Scalia has made noises about maybe wanting to go on to do uh, something else. We don't know about that. They're all relatively young by Supreme Court standards. Nonetheless, there will be vacancies if we count uh, over the next eight years. And so the makeup of the Senate and the makeup uh, the occupant of the White House will play an important role in shaping the future of the Roberts Court. Implications. Our recent demographic shifts indicate that a colorblind approach to school diversity will resegregate our schools. Um, uh, many experts say that racially integrated schools will be beneficial. And we see from statistics that our schools are becoming more segregated. In 1993, we see that 25% 
of Hispanics and 28% of black students uh, attend a majority uh, racially uh, segregated schools. 2005-2006, 29% of Hispanics and 31% of black students attend schools with white students comprising less than 5% of the student body. And so therefore that is a change from 1993. We are becoming more segregated and our students in segregated schools are attended hyper segregated schools. So we, I don't have uh, a, I don't have the view that those schools can't be excellent schools, but often a combination of the circumstances of those children do lead those schools to be troubled schools when you combine um, problems with um, uh, housing, income, homelessness, and other factors that sometimes coalesce uh, in uh, those uh, hyper-segregated schools. Acute racism is still pervasive in the political process. Um, a recent congressional election showed that white Democrats are 38 less per percent less likely to vote for their party's candidate if the candidate is black. And in Senate elections, white Republicans are 25% more likely to vote for a Democrat when the Republican candidate is black. So we still have evidence of a racially polarized voting the Justice Department certainly sees that evidence. It's filed over 1,000 Section 5 objections under the Voting Rights Act. Remember that these are objections to changes in voting rights procedures, which may not go forward without Justice Department preclearance. So there have been over 1,000 Section 5 objections under the Voting Rights Act in a recent uh, two years and that these objections have protected, protected millions of voters in thousands of elections. Some of the changes, uh, more sophisticated changes that do nonetheless have an effect on the voting power of minorities. Discriminatory annexations and de-annexations, so where a city decides to carve off a part of the city and separate from it, or where it decides to enlarge the city by bringing in a population that may be more white, thereby diluting the power of minority voters in those situ uh, circumstances. Uh, pairing black incumbents and redistricting plans, so the legislature redistricts and then creates districts that require black incumbents to run against each other and also relocating polling places away from minority communities. These are some of the changes and practices that the voting rights, uh, that the, uh, the Justice Department um, uh, must, um, must address in trying to preserve the right to vote in 2011. In employment, Again, looking at the implications of the Rieke case, the possibility that the court may strike down Title VII as applied to public employment and may go further and strike down Title VII as inconsistent with the constitutional standard for discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause. We see many disparities. The recession has disproportionately affected minority workers, black unemployment, as of last month was twice as high as that unemployment in the white population, 7.9 as compared with 15.5. And these are nationwide figures. If we look city to city, we see even more egregious differences in unemployment. Also, occupational segregation. Uh, EEOC statistics show that 87% of US occupations are racially segregated, that median hourly wages for black men uh, are less uh, than they are for white men, and that even when you account for disparities in educational attainment, black men with a high school diploma or bachelor's degree a bachelor's degree earn only 74% of what white men earn. So we still have occupational segregation with dire economic consequences. So what will be the legacy of the Roberts Court if this trend continues? 